Welcome again, brothers and sisters. We really appreciate uh, our Heavenly Father for giving us the Sabbath, that uh, in it we may find delight. Indeed, uh, the Sabbath was created for man. And uh, this is a time to repose and uh, think about the manifold blessings of the Lord. I'm so glad for the session that has passed about uh, the millennial judgment and uh, many things to, many more things to unlearn. And uh, I pray that the Lord may give us a heart to accept the truth in its entirety. For we are told that uh, half reformations and half information is worse than infidelity and uh, no information. I want to welcome you to uh, the presentation that uh, is uh, before us. And uh, we have been going through the Minneapolis 1888 and the aftermath. And then uh, we have been looking at the issue of justification by faith. This is uh, the second last presentation in this series. And uh, at this hour, we are going to look at uh, uh, how did he overcome. Yesterday, when the Vespers and the Sabbath uh, began, we looked at uh, the temptations of Jesus Christ and the setting of all the temptation in the wilderness. And so I want to look at how did he overcome those temptations in the wilderness. And uh, before we go further, we can uh, bow for a, a word of prayer if we may. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for thou art so gracious unto us, a sinful people needing redemption, thou sending thy son to die for us. And indeed in thy son, you gave thyself to humanity and the suffering of thy son was thy suffering. Help us to understand this plan of redemption and draw closer to thee in every faculty of our, our, uh, of our being. And uh, as we continue living on this earth, may we grow in stature, in measure of the man Jesus, being in favor with thee and in favor with man. And so guide us and order our lips and our ears this time that we may understand divine things. In Christ Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Uh, it has uh, been a long journey, a history. And I can say that... Uh, in these 25 presentations, we have exhausted the issue on justification by faith. In fact, this is the plan of redemption and we shall be studying it, it, it um, uh, even when uh, the redeemed get into the city of God. And so what we have done in this uh, uh, series is just to uh, patch up some uh, information bring out uh, some clues and lay a foundation, a thorough foundation on justification by faith. We can uh, boast or pride that uh, we have taken into consideration every scripture and every quote that has to do with the issue of justification. As the Lord, we have been able to go and uh, we invite uh, a serious Bible searcher and uh, those who are interested in the plan of redemption to continue studying of these things, if they be so, and be able to present the issue of justification by faith and the plan of redemption before the people in the right way and restore the pillars of our faith and restore the doctrines that uh, will help us to be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And even not only prepares for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but prepare to live eternally with our Lord and our Savior. And so this is a, 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 a lesson that uh, really has to preoccupy our minds. There is no other message that should preoccupy our minds. In fact, we are told that uh, the issue of justification by faith will be the doctrine that will swallow every other doctrine, the Lord, our righteousness. And uh, when you explore the sanctuary message, then you come to understand 
if there is any other thing that we need to know, if we will never come to understand anything, is how man is saved and the obligations that he has to his creator as long as, as he still breathes. And so I'll welcome you. Uh, we continue studying, we continue sharing. And uh, right now we are going to look at uh, Minneapolis 1888 and the aftermath, how did he overcome? We have seen great things that have been talked about in the book Questions on Doctrines. And uh, I wish we will just have a series covering the book Questions on Doctrines and see the departure of our faith and even in the issues that has to do with justification by faith and how they departed from the true statements that Christ came after the nature of Adam fallen and not before that. Because when you go to the book Question and Doctrines, we should, you will find such a statements that actually contradict what is written in this inspiration and in the Bible. The book is invaluable, but it's not infallible. It has some things which are contrary to what is the truth. Uh, how he overcame. This is the question that uh, we should be asking. This is the slide that we left on yesterday. And if you are not blessed to watch the presentation of yesterday evening Vespers, you can go on my timeline and uh, be able to watch the temptations of Jesus Christ, how he was tempted. And then this, uh, this uh, very topic, uh, this very presentation that we are going to make right now will resonate with what we are saying. And so we left on this slide. Many have no real faith in Christ. They say it was easy for Christ to obey the will of the Father. And why? For he was divine. But God's word declares he was tempted in all points like as we are. And so if we say that uh, Christ was able to overcome sin because of his divinity, then essentially what we are saying that man cannot be able to overcome sin because he is not placed where Christ was placed. And then we are saying that really Christ was not tempted in all points as we are because he is not like us. And so how can he be tempted as we are when he is not like us? Christ was tempted according to his elevation of the mind, but he will not weaken or cripple his divine power by yielding to temptation signs of the time, October 14, 1897. And uh, so his mind was a mind that kept the purity of the law of God every time when he will be tempted. And uh, we saw yesterday that even his own brothers could tempt him. His, when he was a child, his fellow youths could tempt him to sin, but uh, he was able to put um, sin in, in its rightful place and place it besides the mirror of the law of God. And that is when he could differentiate between evil and um, uh, righteousness or evil and good, and then he will choose to do good and not evil. And so he did not overcome because he was divine, but he overcame because he forever lived to do the will of his father. When did Jesus use his divine power then? Because we find that uh, he was, uh, he had divinity. He had two individualities in him, two natures in him, I mean, and each retained its individuality. The deity was not humanized, neither the humanity was deified. And so when did he use his divine, divine power? In fact, the temptations of Jesus Christ are tenfold difficult than what Adam went through because he had divinity and he had humanity. And so uh, in the temptations, we saw that um, Satan tempted him on his sonship so that he could do any miracle according to his sonship, according to his divinity, but Christ refused to do this. And so when did he use his um, uh, divinity? John eleven forty three. 43, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth with intense and painful interest, all wait for the test of Christ's divinity. The evidence that is uh, substantiate his claim to be the son of God or extinguish the hope forever. Is that of ages 536.2. When did Christ use divinity? It was not for him overcoming sin, but it is was for the benefit of humanity. As we see in Desire of Ages, page 21, paragraph 2, that uh, uh, Christ received also that he may give. 
uh, from the father to the son to us, a, uh, a, a title of beneficence comes to us and back to him. And so the world redeemer was equal with God, yes. His authority was as the authority of God. He declared that he had, um, he declared that um, he had no existence separate from the father. The authority by which he spoke and wrote miracles was expressly his own. Yet he as he assures us that he and the father are one. That is 7 ABC 439.1. So, and uh, I want you to mark the words in yellow, the authority by which he spoke and wrote miracles. So he could only speak and then the miracles were wrought. The angels of God are ever passing from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. And look here, the miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministration of angels. So Christ had the authority to speak and then the angels were able to do that which he wanted them to do because he has given them the power to do the same. And uh, because he's their creator and it is through Christ by the ministration of his heavenly messengers that every blessing comes from God to us. In taking upon himself humanity as Savior unites his interest with those of fallen sons and daughters of Adam, while through his divinity he grasps the throne of God. And thus Christ is the medium of communication of men with God and of God with men. So we only find that the instances where Christ used uh, his divine power was to uh, for the benefit of humanity and all the miracles that he did were done by the power were done by the angels through the power of God and uh, throughout his life on earth his power must be exercised for the good of suffering humanity alone you notice the word alone the suffering of humanity not of his own suffering and overcoming in it, uh, 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 sin or overcoming any temptations. Christ's temptation was the temptation as men have them today. And he held on the hand of omnipotence to be able to overcome sin. But now when it comes to using his divine power, he exercised it for the good of the suffering of humanity alone. He was, how was Jesus to use his divine power? It was no part of his mission to exercise divine power for his own benefit. This he never did in his earthly life. His miracles were all for the goodness of others. So Christ was the carrier of, uh, of the Godhead, of the three omnis, but um, he never exercised them. The only time he could exercise his divinity or his power or his omnis was for the sake of the humanity. All the miracles done by the angels and uh, the angels of God are ever moving up and down from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth. All the miracles of Christ, uh, all the miracles of Christ performed for the afflicted and suffering were by the power of God through the ministration of angels. Let us look at the book of John chapter one, the book of John chapter one, and uh, you can put 2SP67 be, be, uh, before this text. In uh, John chapter 1, verse uh, 49 to 51. John chapter 1, verses, uh, 50, verses 49 to 51. And the Bible records, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. This is a conversation that uh, Christ was having with Nathaniel and tells him, you see, before uh, uh, I came here, I saw you. Uh, and Nathaniel is wondering, how was he able to see him? And then he goes in verse 50, say, Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than this. And then in verse 21, where I actually have put to a 67.2, the Bible says, and he said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you here, after you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the son of man. And so uh, how did he overcome? The angels of God are ever moving up 
and down from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth, all the miracles of Christ performed for the afflicted and suffering were by the power of God through the ministration of angels. Christ consented to take humanity and thus he unites his interest with the fallen sons and daughters of Adam here below. While his divinity grasps the throne of God and thus Christ opens the communication of man with God and God with man, all the blessings from God to man are through the ministration of holy angels. And uh, I, I found this uh, so interesting by the way, when I was studying about how Christ overcame that uh, you know, the Bible records in the book of Acts and in the book of Psalms that uh, we have guardian angels. When Christ became a human being, when he assumed the human nature, you know, he was given guardian angels, just like humanity is given guardian angels. This thought really brought uh, uh, brightness to my face in my life. It uh, really brought a lot of joy in my life. I'll just show you one of those quotes that uh, really Christ uh, uh, had guardian angels to minister before him uh, in his uh, ministry. We are told that uh, uh, this is uh, in Desire of Ages, page 832, paragraph 1. I see if uh, I can put it uh, on the screen. Yes, we are told. While the disciples were still gazing upward, voices addressed them, which sounded like richest music. This is when uh, in the ascension of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts chapter one. They turned and saw two angels in form of men who spoke to them saying, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. These angels were of the company that had been waiting in a shining cloud to escort Jesus to his heavenly home. The most exalted of the angel throne, they were two, and I want you to mark this, they were two whom had come to the tomb at the resurrection, Christ's resurrection, and they had been with him throughout his life on earth. So these two angels that came at the resurrection tomb were the ones who were with him throughout his earthly life to guard him from any injury and guard him against falling into temptation. With eager desire, all heaven had waited for the end of the tarring in a world marred by the cause of sin. The time had now come of the heavenly universe to receive their king. Did not... Two angels longed to join the throne that welcomed Jesus, but in sympathy and love of those who he had left, they realized they, they waited to give them comfort. So this is what we are told, that these two was with him all his ministry, and they were left behind to comfort the disciples as even Jesus Christ ascended in heaven. And look at what is quoted here now. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. These two angels were with Jesus Christ all over, uh, uh, all of his life on the earth. So th there is no power that was enlisted to the service of Jesus Christ here on earth that has not been enlisted upon us. The angel of God encompassed around them who love him and they keep them as we are told in the book of Psalms. And so as the angels guarded upon our savior and our Lord and were able to instruct him, so even today we are given guardian angels to be able to uh, uh, guide us and uh, make sure that uh, our feet does not stumble and help us to overcome sin. This is how Jesus Christ overcame and this is the power that is enlisted upon us to overcome. And so, Angels guarded him. Uh, this is uh, to SP 114, paragraph one. We read thus, the unbelief bred malice. Satan controlled their minds and they crowd out against the savior with wrath and hatred. The assembly broke up and the wicked people laid hands upon Jesus, thrusting him from the synagogue and out of their city. This is our God now assumed uh, the human nature, and it seems that he is helpless in the sight of the mob who wants to throw him uh, 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 headlong down. 
in fact, we are told that the first, uh, the, the first sermon of Jesus Christ in the synagogue, they took him and wanted to throw him headlong down. Why? Satan went, wanted to make sure that the plan of redemption does not succeed. He wanted to make sure that when Christ falls down from the high cliff headlong, then he will be dead, dashed into pieces. But look at what happened in this instant. Christ does not exercise his divine power at all through this temptation. There's something going on. The assembly broke up and the wicked people laid hands upon Jesus, thrusting him from the synagogue and out of their seat and would have killed him if they had been able to do so. All seemed eager for his destruction. They hurried him to the brow of a steep precipice, intending to cast him headlong from it. Shouts and maledictions filled the air. Some were casting stones and dirt at him, but suddenly he disappeared out of their midst. Now people said that Christ at this point exercised his divinity and vanished away. Just like you see in Nigerian movies and Hollywood movies, people have watched TVs and movies until they think that the plan of redemption is some fictitious story where we have pretenders trying to uh, 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 waft in and waft off of, uh, out of uh, uh, their of, of sins. And so, um, but suddenly he disappeared out of their midst. They knew not how or when. What happened? angels of God attended Jesus in the midst of the infuriated mall and preserved his life. The heavenly messengers were by his side in the synagogue while he was speaking and they accompanied him when pressed and urged on by the unbelieving infuriated Jews. These angels blinded the eyes of that maddened throng and conducted Jesus to a place of safety. Do you see what happened? The angels blinded these people. And then uh, they, 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 they prevented his destruction in the book of Psalms 121. The book of Psalms 121. This is uh, what uh, the true witness says. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from when forth my help cometh from. And I, I like to suggest to you that you start reading the division of Psalms in a different way, knowing that there are prophecies about Jesus Christ. David, Asaf, and all the other people who are writing the Psalms were not just writing poets and Psalms and hymns. These were prophecies. Most of them are prophecies about Jesus Christ himself. And so, I believe this song of degrees in 121 also refers to the circumstances that Jesus Christ was in. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So uh, this is an individual psalm. The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shed upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil, he shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. This is a psalm of degrees, talking about how we are preserved, how Jesus Christ was preserved so that his feet will not be dashed or uh, his body will, or his soul will not be dashed headlong down. And so the angels conducted him to safety and we are told that uh, the angel of the Lord encompassed around the righteous. In Gethsemane, look at uh, what happened in Gethsemane. The garden of Eden with its foul blood of disobedience should be carefully compared with the garden of Gethsemane. So what happened in Eden has to be compared with ha what happened in Eden and even applied in our lives, where the world's redeemer suffered superhuman agony when the sins of the whole world were rolled upon him. Listen to the prayer of the only begotten son of God. Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. So Christ in his humanity, we are told that he could not go uh, to be tempted in the wilderness. He will not go to the grave. According to his human will, he will not go through this suffering. 
But what does he say? If this cup may not pass, but not according to my will, but as thou will. And the second time he prayed saying, oh my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I bring it, thy will be done. And the third time he prayed saying the same words. Oh, it was here the mysterious cup trembled in the hands of the son of God. Shall he wipe the bloody sweat from his agonized countenance and let him go? It is like Sister White is asking, will Christ now use his divinity or will Christ now say that I'm all done with this plan of redemption? I have done what I can do. Let me go back to heaven. The wail, wretchedness and ruin of a lost world roll up before him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. So Christ does not use his divinity. He resorts to prayer at this moment and not his divinity. And this is what we should be doing. We are studying these things so that we may know how he overcame and how we can overcome. We are told, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. To the ground. I have somehow a little bit studied about how Christ was able to sweat uh, blood at that moment. It is, a, it is also covered, Behold the Man, uh, in some little book, Behold the Man. It is, uh, it is a wonderful book that uh, I recommend for you to read what made the, 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 uh, this veins rupture and uh, give away blood instead of water. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. So instead of Christ using divinity to go through this experience of Gethsemane, he goes through it as a man. And then what happens? An angel appears to help in him to be able to go through the temptation. Continued on in the garden of Gethsemane, no traces of his recent agony were visible as Jesus stepped forth to meet his betrayer. Standing in advance of his disciples, he said, who seek ye? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. As this word was spoken, the angel who had lately ministered to Jesus moved between him and the mob. Sometimes people have wondered what happened in the garden of Gethsemane. Did Jesus Christ use his divinity? Here the spirit of prophecy in Desire of Pages 6 and 4, paragraphs 5 and 6 tells us, the angel who had lately ministered to Jesus moved between him and the mob. A divine light illuminated the Savior's face. And at the baptism, the spirit of the Lord came in the form of a dove and said, and uh, a voice was heard saying, this is my beloved son. Uh, uh, this is my uh, beloved son whom I'm well pleased with. And then the same scenario happens again between, uh, uh, happens again in the garden of Gethsemane. So in the presence of this divine glory, uh, I'll repeat, a divine light illuminated the Savior's face and dove-like form overshadowed him. In the presence of his divine glory, the murderer's throng could not stand for a moment. They staggered back. Priests, elders, soldiers, and even Judas fell as dead men to the ground. The angel withdrew and the light faded away. Jesus had opportunity to escape, but he remained calm and self-possessed. As one glorified, he stood in the midst of that hardened band, now prostrate and helpless at his feet. The disciples looked on, silent with wonder and awe. These are the scenes. How did he overcome? Did he use his divinity? Angels were always coming to help him. How was Jesus to use his divinity again? Again and again, he, Jesus, would have been killed had it not been for the heavenly angels, not for his divinity, who attended him and guarded his life until the time when the case of the Jewish as a nation would be decided. Review and Herald, October 12, 1897, and Truth About Angels, page 191. Christ was known to exercise divine power for his own benefit. He had come to bear trial as we must do, leaving us an example of faith and submission. So the only way to overcome sin is by faith and submission. And so we find this church, Jesus Christ had divinity. He had this clothed in humanity. He was able to exercise omnipresence, omniscient and omnipotent, but 
what, did Jesus ever use these things? Yet in the world where Satan claimed, a domin claimed dominion, God permitted his son to come a helpless babe, subject uh, to the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it, at the risk of failure and eternal loss. If you haven't seen the presentation, the risk of eternal loss, uh, check it on my profile again will be able to see what was risked by Jesus Christ. Heaven could be lost to him and he could lose his godhood if he had sinned. So divinity inactive for himself and active for, for humanity. This is what we find over and over again. The omniscient knowledge of the past it is the capacity to know everything that is there to know, having complete or unlimited knowledge, awareness, or understanding, perceiving all things. Luke 252, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophet, he learned of the heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. So he did not tap into his omniscient to know the things that he had to know as a human person. His mother had to teach him all these things. While we find that uh, in the book of John, when he is talking to Philip and talking to some people, he says that he did not commit his life to men because he knew the hearts of all men. He knew the heart of all men, meaning that he has a super knowledge of uh, uh, the mankind or the, the human family, meaning that he had his omniscient knowledge, but he did not tap into it as a human person to be able to know what will happen next and how to evade it. He always learned from the mother and he always depended on his father and the help of the angels to go about his daily human life. He learned a trade with um, uh, his own uh, hands worked in the carpenter's shop with Joseph. And, uh, and uh, in the simple garb of common labor, he walked the streets of little town, going to and returning from his humble work. He did not employ his divine power to lessen his burdens or lighten his toy. So he had these divine powers, but he did not employ them. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears, and him that was able to save him from death, and was hard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet he learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Omnipotent, all power, John 5, 19 to 20 and 30, in becoming man's substitute and conquering where man had been vanquished, Christ was not to manifest his divine power. He did not have to manifest his power to know everything, omniscience. He was not allowed to exercise omnipotent power to do everything. Christ was not to manifest his divine power to live his own suffering. For fallen man could work no miracles in order to serve himself from pain. Just as humanity cannot... Uh, uh, do not have the divinity to do all things. So Christ as a, a divine person was not allowed to use his divinity to do all things because he had to do things as a human being so as to leave us an example of a human being overcoming. And Christ as his representative was to bear his trials as a man, leaving an example of perfect faith and trust in his heavenly father, 2 SP 92.4. If he could have exercised his divinity, then there will have been no faith, perfect faith in depending on his father. Then humanity, when they are brought into great straits, instead of uh, depending on the heavenly father, they could, they, they, they could depend on themselves. This is, uh, as we go about our daily duties in our practical issues, when we face uh, discourages, when we face temptations on the road, when we face temptation from our spouses, it is not in... Uh, the plan of God that uh, we may formulate something to escape these temptations, but we may depend on our heavenly father to be able to overcome. And after overcoming, we may show the others who are the tempters and 
who will one day be lured towards salvation that really this is human overcoming and also if i hold on the hand of god i can be able to overcome and that is why we don't have to practice any deception we don't have to practice anything that will make the overcoming something mysterious but we have just to exercise implicit faith in the father the eternal son of god just as mighty uh just as mighty just as infinite neatly gifted with all the resources of power and he was found in person fashion of a man if thou be the son of god command that these stones be made bread but but by such an act as this christ will have broken his promise that he will never exercise his divine power in order to accept any difficulty or suffering that man in his humanity must meet revian herald my 14 1908 paragraph 4 If thou be the son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Such an act of creative power, as is the tempter, will be conclusive evidence of divinity. It will bring the controversy to an end. And he knew that in a moment, by the flashing forth of his divine power, he could lay his cruel tormentors in the dust. It made the hell the harder to bear. Can you imagine you are brought in a, a situation where you have something to use? but uh, you are not allowed to use it for the sake of not gratifying the, the the pleas of the devil to be able to do such a thing and so our work is not always to be showing forth some power to prove the claims of the devil no our work is to vindicate the character of god while we live on this earth our work is to show the people that uh, sin can be overcome and not in in another mysterious way Christ was pushed to the cross the stage requiring the strength of all his faculties to resist the inclination when in danger to use his power to deliver himself from peril and to triumph over the power of the prince of darkness revian herald april 1875 again it was a difficult it was as difficult for him to keep the level of humanity as it is for men to rise above the low level of their depravedness natures and be partakers of the divine nature if you think that christ did not struggle think to uh, think about it again if you think that christ did not struggle christ had to struggle a lot when he was on earth because he had to keep his divine power in check so that it may not be used to lessen his sufferings when he was on earth and so how did he overcome he overcame as man is supposed to to overcome her faith in God talking about his omnipresence the holy spirit is christ representative by diversity of the personality of humanity and independent thereof combined with humanity christ could not be in every place personally his humanity uh, really combined him to be in every place every time he could have thrown away his humanity and be able to regain all the powers that he could use but he did not attempt to do this and so all this temptation Christ was uh, brought to bear upon himself in the healing of the sick his omnipresent spirit could be used to heal the sick all the miracles were done by the powers of the angels he could exercise his authority to bid the angels to go and do that Christ never used these powers to do anything to satisfy the curiosity of satan and so yesterday we said when we were looking at the fourth temptation in luke chapter 4 we were told that uh, uh after tempting jesus christ to uh, bow before him after showing him all the worlds and tempting jesus christ to bow before him the devil jesus christ rebuked him he told him that uh, uh, a man is only supposed to worship god and god alone and after rebuking the devil uh the bible says that the devil left him until opportune time and i want us to look at this opportune time and how he was able to overcome even at this time that the devil came in full force to uh uh try to tempt jesus to uh leave the plan of redemption and go back to heaven so he tempted him all the 40 days he was in the wilderness he tempted him as a child and then now comes the last moments of jesus christ here on earth 
Luke chapter 4, verse 13, until an opportune time came. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, that is in the wilderness of temptation, he departed from him for a season, KJV. When the devil had finished all the, this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity time came. What was this next opportunity time? This, we find that um, it was in the garden of Gethsemane when he was uh, to uh, go to the cross. This day with God, pages 263. Starting with the temptation in the garden of Gethsemane going forward when uh, he was going to be crucified. Christ never murmured, never uttered discontent, displeasure, or resentment. He was never disheartened, discouraged, ruffled, or threatened. He was patient, calm, self-possessed, under the most exciting and trying circumstances. Now he's brought before the Sanhedrin, before the Caiaphas, before the Annas, and before Pilate and Herod. And how did Jesus Christ go through this period? He only looked at the Father to overcome. In the context between Christ and Satan during the Savior's earthly ministry, the character of the great deceiver was unmasked. Nothing could so effectually have uprooted Satan from the affections of the heavenly angels and the whole loyal universe as did his cruel warfare upon the world's redeemed. The daring blasphemy of his demand that Christ should pay him for his presumptuous boldness in bearing him to the mountain summit and the pinnacle of the temple, the malicious intent betrayed in urging him to cast himself down from the dizzy height, the unsleeping malice that handed him from place to place, inspiring the hearts of priests and people to reject his love and at the last to cry, crucify him, crucify him. All this excited the amazement and indignation, indignation of the universe. Great Controversy, 1888 edition, 501, paragraph one. I want you to look at this, these things as we read them. If it was certain that prompted the world's rejection of Christ, the prince of evil exerted all his power and cunning to destroy Jesus, for he saw that the Savior's mercy and love his compassion and pitying tenderness were representing to the world the character of God. Satan contested every claim put forth by the Son of God and employed men as his agents to fill the Savior's life with suffering and sorrow. The sophistry and falsehood by which he had sought to hinder the work of Jesus, the hatred manifested through the children of disobedience, his cruel accusation against him, whose life was one of an example goodness, all sprang from deep-seated revenge. The pen of fires of envy and malice, hatred and revenge burst forth on Calvary against the Son of God, while all heaven gazed upon the scene in silent horror. This is in when he was arrested. Crucify him. And it is so interesting, I want you to be observant of these quotes, and you tell me who said crucified him. Because I'm of an idea that the first uttering of the word crucify him did not come from the people, but it was instigated by Satan himself. We read in Christ Triumphant, the same hatred that prompted the cry crucify him, crucify him. The same hatred that led to the persecution of the disciples still works in the children of disobedience. So there's this prompt, there's this cry, crucify him, crucify him. It had its originator and still works in the children of disobedience. It is in their mouths. This conflict was open upon the son of God. He was afflicted, he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The majesty of heaven had to leave the scene of his labor again and again because of Satan's bruising his heel. And finally, Satan's malignity reached its uttermost power when Satan inspired and controlled the minds of the wicked men to crucify him. This was the highest point of his temptation. And this is the point where inspiration says that, crucif that uh, 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 Christ could have left this earth to perish on its own, but he went all through. 
the salvation of men was accomplished by a great sacrifice. Crucify him. And now another sin passed before him. He had been shown the work of Satan in leading the Jews to reject Christ while they professed to honor his father's law. He now saw the Christian world under similar deception in professing to accept Christ while they rejected God's law. He had heard from the priests and elders the frenzied cry, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And now that he heard from professed Christian teachers the cry, away with the law. This is to me the key. If you will see what man will do when he rejects the influence of the grace of God, look to that scene in the judgment hall when the inflated mob headed by Jewish priests and elders claimed for the life of the son of God. See the divine sufferer standing by the side of Barabbas and Pilate asking which he should listen to them. The host cries, and this should be Satan's voice, swelled by a hundred of passionate Satan inspired voices is away with this man and release unto Barabbas. And so there's this hoarse voice and it is swelled by a passionate Satan inspired voices. First of all, there is a voice, not voices, a hoarse voice that goes and then it swells as you will say, into a loud cry. This is a false loud cry, crucify him. So a voice starts this, crucify him. And now it swells, the crowd swells it. And who is inspiring these voices? Saying away with him and release Barnabas. It is only the voice of Satan and the fallen angels. And when Pilate asked what was to be done with Jesus, they cried, crucify him, crucify him. Another quote, again, he asked the question, why, what evil hath he done? Again, they cried out, crucify him. Once more, Pilate expostulated with them against putting to death one against whom they could prove nothing. Again, to conciliate them, he proposed to chastise him and let him go. It was not enough that the savior of the world, faint with weariness, covered with the wounds, must be subjected to the shameful humiliation of such a trial. You see how inspiration puts it. It was not enough that the Savior of the world, faint with weariness and covered with wounds, must be subjected to the shameful humiliation of such a trial. But his sacred flesh must be bruised and mangled to gratify the satanic fury of the priest and ruler. Satan, with his hellish army, had gained possession of them. And Christ could have exercised his divinity in this place, and they could have not been able to stand but he never once tried to do that. How did Christ overcome this? He remained calm and self-possessed. When we are brought into great straits and we are provoked, the only thing we can remain is calm and self-possessed. If you can maintain these two things, then you can go through any temptation. And so men were imbued with a satanic spirit. At the time when they decided that they would have Barabbas, a thief and a murderer in preference to the son of God, the demoniac power triumphed over humanity. Now look at this. Legions of evil angels took entire control of men. So men did not even understand themselves for they were possessed by another and their word, the words that came from their lips actually were ordered by another and not themselves. And in answer to Pilate's question as to whom he should release unto them, they shrieked out, away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. So the demoniac power triumphed over humanity. Legions of evil angels took entire control of men. And in answer, you see who is answering the legions of evil angels. This is how I understand inspiration. It is so very clear to me. This is what inspiration says. Legions of evil angels took entire control of men. And in answer to Pilate's question, what does the legions of evil angels do? They shriek. Remember when a person is possessed with evil spirit, they shriek outwards. It is not them. But actually, the power that possesses them is what shrieks uh, and puts the words on their lips. Away with this man and listen to us, Barabbas. When Pilate spoke again to them concerning Jesus, the host Christ was raised. Crucify him, crucify him. 
Through yielding to demoniac agencies, men were led to take their stand on the side of beta posted. And fallen walls looked upon the scene with amazement, unable to comprehend the degradation that sin had brought. Legions of evil angels controlled the priests and rulers and gave voice to the suggestions of Satan. So what was the suggestion of Satan? Crucify him, the host voice that swelled. And then the evil angels, the legion of evil angels control these priests and rulers and give voice, give utterance. Just as Christ inspires us to speak words, so the legions also inspires uh, the evil men to speak words that belong to Satan gave voice to the suggestion of Satan in persuading and tempting the people by falsehood and bribes to reject the son of God and to choose a robber and a murderer in his stead. They appeal to the very worst passions of the unregenerate heart and start up the worst elements of human nature by the most unjust accusations and, mis and representation. What a scene was this for God to look upon, for seraphim and cherubim to behold. The only begotten son of God, the majesty of heaven, the king of glory was mocked, insulted, tounded, rejected, and crucified by those whom he came to save, who had given themselves the control of Saturn Review and Herald April 14, 1896. This majestic fallen being, the one demon knows all about the warfare that must be waged between good and evil. He has failed the malice of Satan to a greater extent than has have any of his followers. As Saul refused the words of a priest and took the testimony of a sinner, so the statements of all witnesses were received against Jesus. And his own testimony was thrust aside. When Jesus was presented by Pilate to the people and Barabbas was presented with him and the ruler asked, whether of the twin will ye that I release unto you? The multitude under the control of Satan cried out like madmen, away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands, and the demon like crazy arose, cry arose, the demon like cry arose, crucify him crucify him. This was the man in whom no fault was found when he was brought to trial, and yet a robber and a murderer was prepared before him, signs of the time, this September 21, 1888. The host Christ was raised by men who were inspired by Satan. Crucify him. Crucify him. They were possessed at the cross. In fact, from the quotation, you can deduce that it was Satan who first said and instigated the words, crucify him. And then the mob just repeated the chant, not knowing where it came from. They were madmen drunk with demons. Matthew chapter 28, as we, 26, as we close, verses 67 to 68. The act deceiver hope that under the force of despondency and extreme hunger, Christ will lose faith in his father. We are looking at how he overcame. We have seen through the sins at an opportune time for Christ to relinquish the redemption plan, he was able to remain calm and self-possessed. This is what helped him to overcome at the cross. The devil expected him to work a miracle in his own behalf and take himself out of his father's hands. Had he done this, the plan of salvation would have been broken, for it was contrary to its terms that Christ should work a miracle in his own behalf. Bible Echo, November 15, 1892. The deceiver is always with us too. We are told in this. Let us have been coming into me, affirming that Christ should not have had the same nature as man. For if he had, he would have fallen under similar temptations. If he had, if he did not have man's nature, he could not be our example. If he was not a partaker of our nature, he could not have been tempted as man has been. And because he was a man and was tempted as we are tempted and overcame, then we are assured of victory. His temptation and victory tell us that humanity 
must copy the pattern. Man must become a, take, a partake of divine nature. Revealed Herald, February 18, 1890. How can we copy the pattern if we must live with a different nature than he had? How can we say, brothers and sisters, that uh, we can uh, partake the nature of Jesus Christ? Uh, we can, uh, how, how can we copy the pattern if uh, really we can't be, if Christ did not have our nature? It really defies the old to say that uh, Christ has told us to overcome in our nature while he had a different nature in which to overcome it. I pray that uh, the Lord may help us to remain in truth and not to follow the suppositions of men by thinking that Christ used any power to overcome sin rather than depend on his father and by the aid of the angels, which we also have, he was able to overcome. And after overcoming, he became the author of eternal life. May the Lord continue blessing us. May we know that the victory of Jesus Christ is our victory. We can overcome as he overcame. And how do we do this? By actually depending on the Father. I'll close with a, a verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, a familiar verse with us. As we pray, the book of faith. Let us close here. We are two from chapter two from verses one. Philippians chapter two. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in law also on the things of others. This is what lived Jesus Christ lived to do us five, let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are not asked to have the nature uh, of Jesus Christ, but to have the mind of Jesus Christ. His mind was to live up according to the will of his father. His nature was our nature. That is why we are not asked to have his nature, because it was our nature. We are asked to have his mind, because his mind was forever to do the will of the Father. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no repetition and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in likeness of man. So if he was in the likeness or in the form of God, he was God pre-incarnate. He was God. His whole being was God. But now he was fashioned in the form of a servant in the likeness of man. So the, the contrast and the oppositions in this verse actually are equal. If he was God then, if we believe he was God pre-incarnate, we must believe that he was man in incarnation. The statements are clear. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The only way Christ became a victor is by obedience, not by using his divinity. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And if we have victory, we are told that our names shall be changed as even Jacob's name was changed. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. So let this mind be in you, the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, always to do the will of the Father. May the Lord bless us. And may the Lord keep us and give us even victory over sin. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, I uh, just want to say thank you so much. For you are not asking us to do something that uh, your son never did, Lord. You are not asking us anything impossible, but you are only asking us possibilities. And that possibilities is us relying on thee and having the mind of the son to do 
depend on everything to on thee to do everything that we are supposed to do. And so thank you so much. I pray that you may give us the willpower, you may give us the strength, and Lord, you may employ angels on our side to be able to help us overcome sin. Thank you for thy grace, and I know that uh, victory over sin is possible. May you increase our faith in these things, and may you help us not to look to self, but always behold you, for by beholding you, we are changing from glory to glory. May your name be uh, ever blessed, ever more. It is in Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May our Heavenly Father bless us and keep us for his kingdom. Amen.